Good morning. This thing rocked earlier, so I move it a little forward. Maybe it won't rock as much. <clears throat> First thing I want to do is do something I haven't been able to do ever before, and that's to introduce my wife, Wendy. She's a <laughs> she's back. She's back there at the back. We actually got married last Saturday. So, thank you. Okay, who are you? Today I'd like to invite you on a journey, a journey similar to the one that I started about four and a half years ago. This is not the typical journey. I didn't get in a car, didn't get on a plane. It was an experience in, into the Father's heart. And as I was going into his heart, his love was penetrating into mine. And that experience and the things that I've experienced since then has changed my life. And it's, it's, what's really cool about it is every day is a brand new experience. It's kind of like a, sky, a, kind of a kaleidoscope. You turn it and you see something different. Turn it again, you see something different. And that's the way the love of the Father is. <clears throat> I work as a psychologist. And I'll tell you a story. I see people all the time who question their value and who they are, and they're disappointed and discouraged and everything else along those lines. A number of years ago, I worked with an individual who graduated from high school with their, as a valedictorian. Very smart individual, obviously. Went on to a major university and graduated with a bachelor's degree, was on the dean's list for the full time that this person was in that program. Graduated summa cum laude, which is with highest distinction. Went on from there into a master's program, and again was on the dean's list, and graduated summa cum laude. And at her graduation with her master's degree, her father came up to her and said, I'm surprised you were able to pull it off. So if you had been that person, what would you have thought? What would you have felt? When she relayed the story to me later on, she told me that story with tears in her eyes because she had hoped that her accomplishing a master's degree would have resulted in her father loving her and being proud of her and for being able to express that. But obviously, he was not able to do that. And so even though this person was in their mid-20s, they were still looking for something from their father, that validation that they were important, that they were smart, that they were capable, that they were competent. But again, that father was not able to do that. And people who, even if we grew up with good parents, our parents are never able to meet every need that we have for attention, validation, affection, security, all of those sorts of things. They don't give us a sense of security. So let me think, let me kind of talk about this a little bit. Where's our sense of security come from? In our society, we generally look at four things, actually three things. And then if you're a part of the church, you can bring in a fourth thing. Oftentimes, we look for our security through people, through things, the stuff we own, and our jobs or what we do. But what happens if those things are taken away from us? Either a person dies, people move, we have a fire, things burn up, or we have an injury and we're no longer able to do the things that we were doing in the past. The fourth thing is our relationship with God. That is always going to be secure no matter what happens, no matter what you do, no matter where you are. At any moment, you can call out and he's going to be there for you. Let's look at some passages. In the, in the book of Luke, chapter 15, 
Jesus tells the, the people that are there, and if you look at the context of this, and I didn't include this in the, in the scripture, so I'll have to kind of summarize this for you. In the, first, in the first story that Jesus tells, he's talking about, and, it, and it, this is happening in front of the tax collectors and the sinners. Also there, the Pharisees and the scribes. These are two different, completely different people, and they usually didn't intersect with each other because the scribes and the Pharisees, they hated the sinners and they hated the tax collectors. But here they are together, and if you look at the passage, it actually says that, they were, that the scribes and the Pharisees were angry at Jesus because he was hanging around with the people that were sinners, the prostitutes, and the tax collectors. So, first parable. It's the parable of the lost sheep. Okay, you've probably heard this story before. The shepherd has 99 sheep. One of them runs off, and he goes looking for it. When he finds it, he gets in contact with his family and friends and have them come around and rejoice and, and be glad with him that he's found this sheep that was lost. The second story, the lost coin. I don't know if you've ever lost something, but this lady lost this coin. And we might think, well, that's probably not a big deal. But if you look at some of the things that some of the scholars have said about this story is that this coin could have been equal to a day's wage. So if you lost a coin and it was worth a day's wage to you, how much time and how much energy would you put into finding it? It also... There are some who believe that it could have been a part of a series of coins that would have been in the dowry that this lady had received when she married. And so if one coin is missing, the total value of those coins decreases. Plus, because if it were a dowry, it would be worth even more money than just a regular coin would be. So here she, she turns on the lights, she sleeps the floor, she looks under the couch, she looks under the bed, and eventually she finds this coin. And again, like the shepherd, she calls for her family and her friends to come and to rejoice with her and to be happy that she had found the coin. At the end of each of those stories, one of the things that Jesus adds is that whenever a lost sheep or a lost coin or a lost soul comes into the kingdom, the angels in heaven rejoice. So when you became a believer, the angels in heaven rejoiced over you, just like your father did. Okay. Now the third story, and everybody is probably very, very familiar with this story, and that's the story of the parable of the prodigal son. And so let's look at it. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me, and he divided. Well, let me stop there. In our day and time, he might not think too much of this. Okay, a kid's coming to his father and asking for his inheritance. In that day and time, that would have been considered to either be a curse or the desire that the father was no longer this young man's father or that he was dead. So let's kind of... Stop and think about that for a moment. If you ask yourself, what would have happened in the years and the months and the days before that that would have resulted in a son developing that kind of an attitude towards his father? Maybe some resentment, disappointment, discouragement, those kinds of things. And in that society, the father typical father in that culture would have had a couple of options. One, beat the kid to death, take him to the city gates, and the city fathers would have done that. They would have stoned the kid. Uh, there's a gentleman named Kenneth, Dr. Kenneth Butler, who's a missionary to the Middle East, and in the villages that he's gone to, he's asked them about this story, and if any of those locations, if anybody had ever heard of an individual doing something like that, going to the father, their father, and at them for the inheritance. And in all of that 40 years, he's only heard two stories where that happened. In one, the father did beat the kid almost to death. And the third, or the second, the father died a week later. 
And Dr. Butler asked him, well, what do you think happened? And his father perceived his son's actions as a curse. And he died as a result of that. Okay. But here, we see that his father did something different. He divided his property between them. And so the father did something that was very culturally unusual. But the other thing that happened in the story is that by the son doing this, showed a complete disregard, disrespect, and a total lack of awareness or care or concern or compassion towards his father. He was just caring. He cared only about the stuff that he was going to get from his father. After he goes off, not many days later, the son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Okay, pigs were an unclean animal. If you've never been around pigs, when I was a kid, my parents had, used to get pigs, and they're dirty, they stink, and if you find mud, they're going to be right in the middle of it. And if you're feeding the pigs, you're probably going to stink, and you'll be muddy. The other thing about this is that he went off and he worked for a Gentile. To a Jew, you couldn't get much lower than working for a Gentile, and even lower than that was feeding the pigs. So here this young man is. He's left his father, his family, and his village and his community, and he's gone off to this poor, this other country, and because of the famine, is now working for a Gentile, and he's feeding pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So even though he was hungry, you know, who wants to eat the stuff that pigs eat? It's slop. It's usually rotten stuff, and they just, you know, that's what they eat on. And so that's what he was almost to the point where he was going to do. Um, the other thing that I thought about as I was looking at this story, let's go on to the next and then chapter, verse 17, but when he came to himself, okay, if you were this kid, how long would it have taken you to come to yourself? A few days, a few months, a few years. The more stubborn we are, probably the longer it would have taken us to get to the point where, you know, my hunger is less than the guilt that I'm going to experience, or, or the hunger is more than the guilt that I'm going to experience by going back home. So he made the decision, and he said to himself, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy that you called your son. Treat me as, your, as one of your hired servants. So even though this young man was a son, his identity at that point in time was not as a son. He just wanted to be treated, treated kind of like one of the servants. So he arose and went to his father. If you have kids and if they've done anything wrong, what do we do? Sometimes we wait, we stand back, and we wait for them to come to us. But that's not what this father did as we read on. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. So let's, let's kind of tear this apart a little bit. To see somebody from a long way off, you have to go out and be watching. So I don't think, you know, thinking about this father and the things that he does, he doesn't just go out once in the morning and then come back in and then come back out the next day. The sense that you get from this story is that the father's consistently out there looking for his son. And at that point in time, had no idea whether he was alive or dead. But he continued to look and he continued to watch. When he saw him, what's he do? He runs. 
Let's go back to the society, first century society. In that environment, people that were in the upper portions of the society would not run and would not even walk fast because it was a sign of disre disrespect and just a lower people, people of, of stature wouldn't lower themselves to that kind of an activity. But that's what the father does. He embraces him and he kiss him, kisses him. Okay, let's, let's think back to what the kid was doing. This kid's been feeding pigs. Pigs stink. How do, how, how do you think the boy smelled? His clothes were probably ragged. And servants and slaves back in those days didn't wear shoes. So his feet would have been nasty. His whole body would have been nasty. Here this father is running to him, grabbing him. It reminds me of some of the videos that I've seen of parents coming back from the military and they'll go and they'll see their kids and their kids will start running towards them or the father or the mother will be running towards the kid and just so excited and with joy, tears in their eyes seeing the kid. So he not only hugs him, but he kisses him. You ever wake up in the morning if you're married and you look at your spouse and you start to lean over and, and it's, oh, I guess I need to brush my teeth before we do this. <laughs> and the son tells him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Because when the kid left, not only did he disrespect the father, but he also disrespected the community. You know, in that day and time, the community, it's kind of like if you go to a major university and you flunk out, that's not really good for the university. That's not a good thing for their reputation. So it's kind of like for this community, when this kid leaves, these are the kinds of kids that we raise in this community. They don't care about family. They don't care about community. They don't care about those connections. And so he not only disrespected the father, but he also disrespected the community. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So even though he was a son, he saw himself as a slave or as a servant. And this is the father's response. He talked to the servants, bring quickly the best robe. This would have, this would have been a robe that his father had worn and in the community would have been a reflection of him being restored and reestablished as part of the family. He gave him a ring. In that time period, if you were creating a legal document, you would melt some wax, put it on the document, and then you would put your signet ring into that, and it would be a reflection of you having your family's authority being able to sign or seal that document. And shoes on his feet, as I stated a moment ago. Servants and slaves didn't generally wear shoes. Those were families and those were for sons. He said, bring the fatted calf and kill it and let's eat and celebrate. So the calf would have been large enough that it would have fed a lot more people than just the family. Mom, dad, two kids, and even any servants that would have been there. So this probably would have been an, a, a community-wide party that they would have been invited because, you know, you kill a cow, and back in those days, the ability to keep them fresh for a period of time was not what it was. So they would, everybody would have been there. So keep that in mind. And, and his father's response was for this, this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So think about the party that would have gone on. For some people in, suggest that this party would have been similar to a marriage or wedding ceremony. So everybody would be there. Okay. So, as we follow on to the next portion, we get to meet the older brother. And just about all of us have an older brother or you know somebody who's similar to the older brother. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So let's kind of expand this a little bit. Older son's been out in the field all day. He's been sweating. He's hot. He's dirty. He's hungry. Ready to just relax. And as he comes in, he hears the music. 
What's going on? Who started the party? Why didn't they come and get me? I'm, I'm, I'm important in this household. I'm the older son. I'm the heir to everything that my father has got. But here they are. They didn't come out and get me. Why, what, why did they leave me out? So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. Your father has killed a fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound. So let's kind of think about a little bit more of the attitude of this older brother. I've worked for you. I've slaved. And so even though the older brother is also a son, what's his identity? I've worked for you and I've done everything you've ever commanded me to do, even if I didn't necessarily agree with it. And so he's angry, probably both at his brother for coming back, because now that his brother's back, if dad gives him the robe, if he gives him the ring, then some of the stuff that would have been coming to me when dad died is now being given to my younger brother who's already had his inheritances and wasted it. So he's angry at the father too because the father welcomes this kid who's wasted his money and everything else back to the family. And, and part of the, maybe some of the things that the older brother might have said, here's this disrespectful, lazy, unclean, wasteful brother and you kill a fatted calf for him. You never let me wear any of your robes. You never gave me the ring. And you don't, look at my shoes. You don't care about what my shoes look like. They're dirty. They're wearing out. They're falling apart. So this brother, this older brother's attitude was very, in some ways, similar to the younger brother's attitude. I only really care about what I'm going to get. So his attitude also reflected, Dad, I, I, I consider to you to be, to, to be as dead. He also complained, you never even gave me a, a little goat. So you think about a cow versus a goat. I'm not even worthy enough in your eyes to give me a goat. How many people is a goat going to feed? So now the older son is being just as disrespectful. The other part there is if you kind of expand this a little bit more, all of the people that were there to see the son come back, they've noticed that the father's leaving the party. Where is he going? Let's go see what's happening. So they go outside, and they see the dad and the older son, and they're arguing. That was another thing you didn't do in the Jewish society at that point. You didn't argue with an authority in public, another sign of disrespect. So there's, as the crowd's standing there watching, they're also wondering, what's the father going to do? Is he going to slap him? Is he going to kill him? Is he going to turn around and walk away in shame? How's this man, how's this father ever going to show his face back in this community and be okay? So what's the father do? He calls him son. You're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So this father demonstrated his love for his youngest son by giving him the inheritance. He demonstrates his love for the older son by describing the reasons that he gave for bringing and welcoming the son back. This year, younger brother was dead, and he was lost. And now we find out that he's alive and it's our responsibility to bring him back into the fold and back into the family. So this father is more concerned about his relationship with his kids, with his two sons, than he was his status within the community. 
and his, and his forgiveness and his love were extended before either son recognized or knew their true place within the family or who they were. So even though both of them were sons, they did not see themselves as sons and they did not have that identity. And like the lost sheep and the lost coin, they were also lost but didn't realize it. Jesus leaves the story at that point and does not tell what happened next. It's one of the fascinating things. I sometimes wonder, what's the next, what's the next event that happens? Does the father become angry with the older son, slap him around? Does the older son leave the next day and show just as much disrespect as his younger son has shown? Or do the brothers fight? When we, we look at this passage, one of the questions that should probably come up to our minds is, you know, if you look at the scripture, in between there's this description of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. So is it really, but the question that I pose is that, is the son the one who's actually the prodigal? So let's look at the definition of prodigal. One definition is spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant or having or giving something on a lavish scale. It also describes a person who spends money in a recklessly extravagant way. And so yes, to a certain extent, it does reflect the young man. But who's better reflected in that extravagance? It's the father. And his extravagant expression of his love he didn't kill his kids when he could have. Didn't care about being disrespected in the community. His love for his kids were more important than either of those things. Didn't even matter to him about the stuff. He went beyond the expected cultural norms and didn't kill them or beat them. His love for them allowed him to overlook their actions, to forgive them, and to try to reestablish in them their identity as true sons and to welcome them home. We could look at these stories and conclude that Jesus was a great story teller, but if we do that, then we miss the point and we miss the message that his audience would have heard. The Jews of that culture would have understand, understood that Jesus' story about the prodigal son was actually a reflection of the people that were standing there hearing this story. On one hand, you have the sinners and the tax collectors, the lowest scum of the, quote, society of that day. Also over here on the other side, you have the, the Pharisees and the scribes. And often, never did the two mix because the Pharisees and scribes hated and that's one of the reasons they were so angry at Jesus was because he was inviting the sinners and the tax collectors to come and dine, to come home. And he was wanting to restore the children of Israel, God's children, back to their rightful place as sons and daughters. God from the beginning describes himself as father. If you go back into the Old Testament, even just in the first few verses and chapters, God refers to him as a father of Israel. Jesus, when you look at the words of Jesus in the New Testament, especially to his disciples, one of his major reasons for coming was to reveal the love of the Father, and he did that in that story. And the people of that time would have understood that. I encourage you sometime this week, look, at, look through the Gospel of John and see how the Father interacts with Jesus and how, Je and how Jesus in turn interacts with the Father. Jesus tells the disciples that the Father loves him and that he came saying the things that he heard the Father saying. And that, the, and that the Father loved the disciples in the same way that God loved the, the Jesus.
not only was that Jesus' role, but it's our soul, our soul, also our role in today's society. The Father's calling us home, and he's desiring to bring us into his heart and for him to be able to share his love with us. At the beginning, I told, I told you that I started a journey about four and a half years ago, and when we did what we're getting ready to do, after that, they gave us some time just to kind of think. And so one of the things that I was contemplating what had just taken place, God brought, God brought me back to an experience and a, a cake that I had cooked a couple of times before that. So let me kind of describe this cake for you. German chocolate. After you let it cool, you take a skewer or a chopstick and you poke a bunch of holes in it. Once you've done that, you take a, like an 8 or 16 ounce jar of the caramel ice cream flavoring. You begin to drizzle that over the top of this cake. And as you watch, it just kind of soaks into where those holes are. Put it in the refrigerator for a half hour, 45 minutes, pull it back out. And take a container of heavy cream or Eagle Brand milk. You open it, you begin to do the same thing. You begin pouring it on. Now, if that's not decadent enough, then you get out a container of Cool Whip. You spread the Cool Whip on top. And most important factor to me, not the most important part, but you take some crushed up Butterfingers and spread them on the top. I have no clue how many calories are in this thing, but it tastes wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And so God took me back to that, and I said, okay, what's, what's this got to do with what's just happened? And he said, well, Sid, that caramel and that milk is a reflection of my love as it's penetrating your heart. And as it's penetrating your heart, it's healing those hurts and disappointments. See, even if we had good families, they weren't perfect. And so, and, and as many people are here this morning, I can almost guarantee that there are some who didn't have good families, were not encouraging, and didn't help you along the path of life. And so, that brings disappointments. It also results in us closing our hearts both to sometimes our fathers and mothers, sometimes to friends, sometimes family, sometimes just life in general. And when we close our heart to our families, not only do our hearts close to the family, but it also closes to God. And we do that out of protection and insecurity. So one of the, father, one of the things that the father wants to do is to begin to saturate your heart with his love. And you probably noticed that I was doing something up here with the glass. What kind of a color did the, what color was the water when I first came up here? Clear. Clear. What color is it now? Right. That red water in there is a reflection of the love of God as it pours into your heart. It has the ability to change your heart in ways that nothing else can. They're going to begin to sing. And I'd like you to kind of think about this as a personal message from the Father to you. Listen to the words. Listen to the message and then we'll... 